Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the auditorium at Calvary Road Baptist Church in the city of Monrovia in the Gulag of Los Angeles, located at the south end of the People's Republic of California. You have heard me say repeatedly over a 35-year period of time that I've been here <clears throat> that most spiritual behavior is planned. You plan what you're going to do, and then something happens, and you do what you planned to do. Um, it's wonderful to see Archie here tonight. Um, he is an embodiment of that, because tragedies and heartache and things happen, and people then wonder, what am I going to do, what am I going to do, what am I going to do? That's not when you decide when you, what you're going to do. You decide what you're going to do before that happens, okay? I'm, I'm reminded <clears throat> of the former pastor of the First Chinese Baptist Church in downtown Los Angeles, the late Dr. Timothy Lin, who preached for us a couple of times here. He and his wife were living in, um, in China, and um, <clears throat> the World War II started, the Japanese attacked, and his wife was killed by a strafing run uh, performed by a Japanese Zero fighter plane. Dr. Lin continued to serve God. He made his way to the U.S. <clears throat> uh, he was, for a while, um, a professor of Hebrew at Talbot School of Theology, was one of the Old Testament translators for the New American Standard Bible, the Lachman Foundation. And he was up in San Francisco to preach for a Chinese church up there. And he received word 4.30 one afternoon from the pastor of the church, this is back before cell phones, that his wife had taken a sudden turn and passed. And the pastor said to Dr. Lin, of course I will arrange for your immediate return to Los Angeles. And he says, no, I'm a gospel minister, I preach. And so he preached that evening and then flew back at the first opportunity to Los Angeles the next day. Uh, I say that to say this. Um, you should probably decide right now what you're going to do if. Okay? What are you going to do if? Now, what you may do if might very well be different than what I do if. But I have, for a long time, uh, had the decision made with respect to my wife. What will I do if? And you can just fill in the blank. Um, and my decision from, from October of 1975 onward is whatever happens to her, I'm going to do what I do. I'm just going to do what I do. If it is humanly possible for me to function, I'm, I'm going to do that. Uh, because I don't believe that God's plan, when he gives a man a, a wife, is for that wife to diminish his ministry. I believe that he got the wife to enhance his ministry. I don't believe God gives children to Christian parents so that they will cut back in their ministry. No, 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 no. God gave you the children so that you would continue to serve and perhaps even expand your ministry. And then when tragedy comes into your life, um, I'm, I'm not of the opinion that God's plan for us, insofar as we're able to, okay, I'm not, I'm not denying grief and grieving and things like that, um, but we really ought to contemplate what, what's, What's the plan going to be? If something happens to my wife on a Saturday, 
I may not be able to preach on Sunday, uh, but my plan is to try. If I think I'm going to be a, a blubbering uh, distraction, um, I'll have somebody else preach for me. But I would hope that my wife's ministry will be as uninterrupted as possible should I suddenly be removed from the scene. She would hope that my ministry is as uninterrupted as possible. Why? Because this is part of life. And one of the things that we need to consider is the impact and effect on other people from how we deal with situations. Okay? Dot has a wonderful family. Tremendous support from his sons, from his daughters-in-law, from his grandchildren, friends. He's also got the support network of our church, but not everyone you and I know has that kind of support network. And so one of the things that you and I ought to purpose to do is, is that when tragedy strikes, we, we do everything in our power. Now, now, sometimes we can't, but if we can, unless providentially hindered, you should be with God's people at the next scheduled opportunity. Why? Um, to, number one, be encouraged by them, and to, number two, encourage them. You and I don't have any idea um, how... A person who is suffering heartache and tragedy and loss is an encouragement to other people by how he reacts and responds. Uh, at, at the risk of embarrassing this guy, wow, has he been an encouragement to me over the last two weeks. Man, he has bolstered me and strengthened me and encouraged me uh, and supplied me by God's grace with fortitude to, uh, to serve God and to do what I think God would have me to do. And so thank you, Doc. I appreciate it very, very much. Um, you were an encouragement, uh, was it yesterday? Was it Mrs. Where's Mrs. Moore? Was it yesterday? It was yesterday when you and Sandy came by the church. Dr. Baskin and, and his wife were here yesterday. They just showed up for lunch. Um, and he told, uh, I had mentioned to him, I said, that's Dr. French. He lost his wife just a couple of weeks ago. And then Dr. Baskin walked up to Archie and um, thanked him for persevering and thanked him for being strong and thanked him for being an encouragement and told him, I, I, I know what you're going through. I went through the same thing. My wife had the same the loss of her first husband, those kinds of things. So I wanted to share with you this morning before we go to the Lord in prayer. Um, sit down and think about and make some decisions about what you are going to do if. Okay? Now, maybe you're the kind of person that the way you grieve and the way you react to tragedy is that you just come completely apart and it's a month before you can do anything. Okay, okay. But as soon as you can, you, you need to resume as soon as you can. Some people grieve differently. Some people uh, will grieve in the middle of the night. Some people will grieve when nobody else is around. Uh, depending on the passing of a loved one, some people do most of their grieving before the loved one passes, before the loved one is taken. Um, I don't know what Stephen is going through right now. I suspect that this might have been a shock for him. Uh, so let's do what we can to encourage each other, to bolster each other, to do what we can to help each other, to exhort one another, and so much the more the, the initial reaction of many people is something tragic happened, something painful happened. I know what I need to do. I need to stay home and not see anybody for six weeks. That's not the right reaction. Okay? And some cultures have 
it, people are acculturated into tremendous displays of emotion for long periods of time. During the days of our Lord Jesus Christ, it was the culture of, of the Jewish people living in, in, um, in his area to, to hire professional mourners. They were people who were paid to howl uh, and, and, to, and to lift up their voices so that the people who are grieving wouldn't have to. Well, some cultures that we may come in contact with, that's, that's the way they do things. I understand. I understand. Different people grieve differently. But I, I think we should, insofar as we can, I think we should not only avail ourselves of the means of grace as quickly as possible, but we should make ourselves the instruments of God's grace in other people's lives as quickly as possible. I remember when my, when my mom passed. It was tough, but we had for weeks been prepared for her, for her passing. And there were some people in our church that it hit harder than it hit me because I'd been grieving for weeks. And they were kind of not aware of really what was going on. So imagine what would have happened had I not come to church for a month after my mom passed. Uh, there were a number of people that I would have been of no use to. I could not have ministered to them in any possible way. I'm not asking you to do what you can't do. I'm recommending that you purpose to do what you can do. And that many of the decisions we make about what to do in times of crisis, heartache, tragedy, shock, surprise, are decisions that are best made long before those kinds of things happen. So a guy would say, what am I going to do if my dad passes? What am I going to do if my mom passes? What do I do if my brother passes? What do I do if my spouse passes? What am I going to do if my child passes? And if you don't think that these are valid and appropriate scenarios to visit before these things happen, uh, I would beg to differ with you. Uh, you don't want these things to come upon you unthought of and unprayed about before they happen, okay? You don't want to be caught completely utterly by surprise with respect to what your personal reactions and responses are going to be. Okay? Thank you for paying attention during this period of time. Let's go to the Lord in prayer now, shall we? Father, we thank you for your goodness. We appreciate the wisdom that you give to us in your word and through life's experiences in answer to prayer. And we know why you give us wisdom. You give us wisdom so that we will know how to make decisions for which we will be held accountable by you so that we will be able to make decisions that will affect and influence other people's lives as they watch us, as they listen to us, as they read us, as they study us. Some are believers looking for examples to follow. Others are unsaved people and they're looking to find out what the child of God is made of, what the Christian life really is. Is it, is it a life, knowing Christ, um, that, that where, where strength to endure, strength to persevere, strength to survive is provided by you? Are, are there practical benefits as well as eternal benefits for the child of God? And so help us, Lord, to to uh, recognize, as Dunn once said, no man is an island. Uh, we all have witnesses. We all have an audience. We all have, we are compassed about by so great a cloud of witnesses, not just the angels, but also other human beings. And so help us. Uh, we continue to pray for Ruby and for Archie. We pray at this time for Stephen and for his brother and for his mom. Uh, we would ask that you might greatly comfort them. We pray for, uh, for Veda. Uh, we pray for Joyce and Isaiah. We pray for Larry. We pray for Marina and Donna and Wendy. Uh, we pray for our church ministry. Lord, help us to recognize that there's a lot at stake 
in the way we live our lives and the last thing in the world we want to be, we do, we do not want to be freelance, unattached, lone ranger, do whatever we feel like, whenever we feel like kinds of Christians. We want to live our lives uh, corporately uh, in the congregation, with the congregation, and, and for the benefit of the congregation uh, better achieving this great commission our Lord Jesus Christ left us with, which is so very important. Bless our consideration of your word this evening. Minister grace to us, please. And we will thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please make your way to John chapter 17? And as you're doing that, I just have one announcement this evening, and that has to do with whatever prayer request you would like to ask me about anything at all. Please feel free to send that um, email prayer request to pastor at calvaryroadbaptist.church and I will attend to it in um, as quickly as I possibly can. I, I find that uh, these last couple of weeks, I, I personally um, have found these last couple of weeks very, very challenging. <sighs> God is very good, amen, and he is the God of all comfort. Uh, please find your way to John chapter 17. We will take up verse 25 to begin with, where the Lord Jesus Christ, somewhere, somewhere, I think after he and his 11 men left the upper room, I believe after John chapter 15, they passed by the main entrance to Herod's temple, somewhere over here, but this side of uh, the Kidron Valley and the Garden of Gethsemane at the base of the Mount of Olives, he stopped and offered up this um, high priestly intercessory prayer in the, in, the, in the hearing of these 11 men. So he's speaking to God the Father, but these men are overhearing him. And we have looked at the first 24 verses already. We will wrap it up probably this evening, verses 25 and 26. So we look at verse 25 at this time where the, the Savior says, O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me. So having concluded his prayer requests in verses 1 through 24, verse 24 is the last request that he offered up, where he addressed the Father and expressed his wish that those given to him would be with him. He also expressed there his desire that we see the glory he had received from his Father in eternity past. Those are the last two things he asked for. Then the Lord Jesus Christ brings this high priestly intercessory prayer to a close in these two verses. But notice how verse 25 begins. O oh, Righteous Father is how he begins his final remarks, adding the appellation, O righteous, to his intimate term, Father. Uh, this is a very respectful title and is added to the word Father in verse 24 and Holy Father back in verse 11 and it, isn't it interesting, how many of you heard somebody pray, and they'll pray to God, and they'll say, Father, uh, we say, and then, Father, we, we ask you, Father, we want you, and Father, we, and like every phrase begins with Father, every phrase. So the Lord Jesus Christ has this entire prayer, and he prays to the Father, and makes reference to who he's praying to three times. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of old-fashioned. I don't think that a reference to God should be um, punctuation. Okay? God, I want to thank you. God, I want to ask you. God, I want to tell you. God, I want to that. God, I want to end this. Like, you come to a pause, and instead of pausing, you throw God in there. I think we ought to listen to ourselves when we pray, okay? 
God knows you're talking to him. He remembers that, all right? And it's appropriate to address him um, during the course of your prayer, but at the beginning of every phrase, at the beginning of every sentence, at the beginning of every statement, um, it doesn't, when I've heard people pray that way, it doesn't sound to me like they're praying intelligently. It doesn't sound like they're, that they have thought about what they're asking for. If you would like, I can give you a, an outline of Charles Spurgeon's sermon titled Order and Argument in Prayer, where he shows that when you go to the Lord in prayer, you need to have a plan. And it would be a good idea to plan what you're going to ask for before you ask for it. It's like if you found out that you had an opportunity to step into the bank president's office to ask him for something as a bank employee, wouldn't you sit down and plan what you were going to say? If you, if you had asked for an audience with the president, regardless of who the president is, and you found that you had been your, your request had been granted and you did have opportunity to access and speak to the president, wouldn't you want to plan what you were going to say? And yet some people, they, they just seem to give evidence that they never think about ever what they're going to pray for. And part of the evidence that they never think about what they're going to pray for is they say, God, 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 or Father, 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 Father. You don't talk to people that way. Good morning, Mom. I'm hungry, Mom. I'm thirsty, Mom. Can you fix me waffles, Mom? And then bacon, Mom. And then eggs over medium, Mom. And then some toast on the side, Mom. With jelly, Mom. And a napkin, Mom. And a fork, Mom. Nobody talks that way. We really shouldn't pray that way. Okay? I'm, I'm just trying to help you to become a better prayer warrior so that when you pray, you are praying with maybe a little more, I'm not saying that you got to be fancy pants when you pray, all right? A uh, few things are more interesting and delightful to me than the prayers of a brand new Christian. They're not terribly articulate, but, but they're sincere and they're wonderful, okay? And it's usually the religiosity guys that get into the mom, 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 mom in the request kind of thing. And I don't know why they do that. I've never understood why they do that. I just, I don't think we've got people in our church who pray that way. And I think I'm kind of glad. So the Lord closes out the prayer, O oh, righteous Father. Um, and it's a respectful title. Um, he uses this address three times in the course of this prayer. And I don't think it's a coincidence that if you go back to verse 11, that he addresses God as Holy Father in the midst of a request that we be sanctified. Of course, sanctification is the process of making someone more holy by experience over time. So is it a surprise that he would address God as Holy Father when he's asking for us to be sanctified? No, not a surprise. Not a surprise. And here, Righteous Father is associated with our view of his glory since God's righteousness is engaged for the giving out of all that good which the Father promises and, and which the Son on the cross purchases for us and this is all done righteously. There's no sleight of hand here. There's never any pretend like this didn't happen kind of thing. That's what Islam is all about. To the Muslim, um, they're hoping that Allah will pretend 
like it didn't happen. They, they've expressed, I've, I've heard Muslim theologians state that, that their desire is the hope that Allah will just pretend like it didn't happen. Because he can't forgive it. Why can he not forgive it? Because, because they don't believe in a substitutionary sacrifice for sins. So they have to have a God who just basically pretends like it didn't happen, right? So this righteousness is very important. You should be glad that God is righteous. Uh, righteousness requires a trinity because in order for the Father to righteously forgive and righteously bestow and righteously bless, it has to be that his righteousness has been satisfied by the substitutionary sacrifice and payment for sins of an innocent. And that, of course, is his son. The Lord Jesus then states, The world hath not known thee. Well, we knew that already, but he restates that in his prayer. What are the implications of the world? Now think about this. I promise you, you've never thought about this before. Okay? I stay up nights trying to think of things that I'm hoping people have never thought of before, okay? What are the implications of the world's ignorance of God mentioned here? Since the human race does not know God and is therefore ignorant about the things of God, what qualifications do unsaved people have to render judgments of any kind with respect to God? We know there is a law of sufficient reason that people don't have, people don't even have the right to have an opinion unless they have reasons for it. Okay? Well, I have a right to my opinion. No, actually, you don't. Well, I have a right to my opinion. Eh, no, not really, you don't. Not among the rational and reasoning, you don't, because there's a thing called the law of sufficient reason, which means positions, opinions, have to have some basis. Now, that doesn't mean the basis for your opinion has to always be right, but you have to have some kind of a basis for your opinion. Well, I don't believe that. Well, why not? Just cause. What? Just cause. I don't, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering what parents ought to do if they have children who I just feel like, I don't know. So what qualifications do unsafe people have to render judgments of any kind with respect to God, with respect to being reconciled to God, with respect to being judged by God, because unsaved people are ignorant, as the Lord Jesus Christ said, they are therefore unqualified and utterly without the wisdom needed for making decisions about their own spiritual welfare and interests. You say, well, okay. Have you ever heard an anti-Second Amendment politician talk about firearms? Boy, do they sound stupid. I have here in my hand a 30-round clip that can fire 1,500 rounds a minute. Actually, it's a magazine, it holds stuff, and it can't fire at all. So that's the, kind of, that's the kind of logic you get from people who think that they're qualified to make decisions about that which they are profoundly ignorant about. Transfer that back in the spiritual realm. The lost have no basis for the conclusions they arrive at related to God and the things of God because they know nothing. They do not know God and, and really have no comprehension of the things of God, yet they're determined to make decisions, the wrong ones, the wrong ones, are they not? Oh yes, very decided. Very, very assertive, very strong decisions made in the complete absence of information. Now, don't get me wrong. I, I, I don't believe that we ought to pass a law taking away from people the right to make dumb decisions. I just, I, I believe in the freedom to be wrong, okay? 
all right? But what this means is that the work ahead for the apostles, because they're going to be ministering to people that don't know God and don't know anything about God and are very decided about where they are. And, and by the way, us too, that's, this is who we deal with because this is who we used to be. Amen? And it's going to be hard. It's going to be very, very difficult. And we need great grace um, to deal with not only the ignorance, but also the sinful inclinations of those who do not know Christ. Our Lord continues, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me. It is straightforward logic that shows Christ and those who know Christ to be the only sources of the knowledge unsaved people need and must have regarding any relationship that must be established with God. They don't know how to establish a relationship with God. They don't have the information and they need to have some kind of an in interaction with those that do. And if you do not know anything and have no way of learning what you must know, your only hope is to know him who does know God and those who know the one that God has sent. And that would be you and that would be me. Thus, the unsaved person's only hope is Jesus Christ. And those who know Jesus Christ was sent by God. And that would be you, and that would be me, and that would be people like you and me. We're all they have. We are all they have. Now let's look at verse 26. And I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them and I in them. So when he said, and I have declared unto them thy name and will declare it, put yourself in their shoes. <coughs> 2,000 years ago, on a Thursday evening, right about there, you've paused, the master is praying, He's praying to the God of Israel. And you're listening to him praying to the God of Israel for you and about you. And then you hear him say, and I have declared unto them thy name and will declare it. How comforting it must have been for those 11 guys to overhear the Savior utter these words to his righteous Father. These words, you see, reveal that the Lord Jesus Christ's ministry of declaring God to the world, which he had done, is a ministry that would continue. So the Lord is leaving them. They're very upset about that. But somehow the ministry continues. Remember that these men had been sorely troubled in the upper room by the Savior's announcement to them of his impending departure. Wow, they were bothered by that. And he has assured them of his continued interest in them and an uninterrupted relationship. These words then must have served to further assure them while also serving to show what their future ministry would be like. So that's good. How fitting that our Lord's Prayer will end with the words that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them and I in them. Um, it's all about love, amen? Amen. I mean, it's all about, it's all about love for the Savior and, and, and his men. 
So let's say we do something before we finish our final glance at the Lord's high priestly intercessory prayer. What say we consider how many times in the last few minutes, because I'm guessing that from the upper room to there, maybe five minutes max, probably four, maybe even three, okay? I know how long it takes to walk from here to there at, at a stroll. It's just a couple of minutes, okay? So what say we consider how many times in the last few minutes the Lord directed and, and showed to his little flock the importance that they love each other. From being in that room to being here, how many times? Get your Bible or Bible app out, okay? And turn to John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. This is the first one. They're in the upper room. He said, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that you're my disciples if you have love one to another. Wow, that's important. That's the first. Moments later, John chapter 14, verse 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. Then in verse, 24, verse 21, he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him again. Verse 23, Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. What's that, five times? Verse 31, but that the world may know that I love the Father as the Father gave me a commandment, even so I do. Arise, let us go hence. Wow. Then chapter 15, verses 9 and 10. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue in my love. If you keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. What's that? One, two, three, four, five, six times? Look at verses 12 and 13. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. That's seven. Chapter 15, verse 17. These things I command you, that you love one another. Isn't that eight? Verse 19, if you were of the world, the world would love his own, but because you're not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. And then in verse 26 of chapter 17, and I have declared unto them thy name. He's saying this to the Father, but he's saying it in front of them. Hint, 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 hint. And will declare it that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them. And I am them. Is that nine times? Did anybody count? Nine times. So, what can we conclude from this? Love is a big deal to God. Amen? I mean, God is love. Love is a big deal to God. It's a big deal to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he seeks to make sure love is a big deal to us as well. It's a very, very big deal. It ought to be a major focus of our thought life and our conduct. Further, what did the Lord stress when preparing his men for the persecution they would experience? How are they going to prepare for persecution? By loving each other. Wow. Wow. So, we love him because he first loved us, and the love of Christ constraineth us because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. So, the way Christians love is Christ loves other people through us. So, the key is abiding in Christ, right? The Christ life being your life. Perfect love casts out fear because where there is fear, there's torment. And Christians, although certain things 
can frighten us and can scare us. As Dennis Prager pointed out, uh, and I don't get much from an unsaved former Orthodox Jewish guy who rejects Christ, but he was right about this. The most oft-repeated phrase in the Hebrew Scriptures is fear not. Fear not, 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 fear not. To God's people, to those who have a relationship with God. So, that would suggest to me that fear is a major factor in every human being's life, and it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be. What is it that drives out the fear? What is it that displaces the fear? The love of Christ and love for God. Mm -mm -mm. This is what you call a significant discovery of Bible truth. Amen? Yeah, this is a keeper. Let's pray, shall we? Thank you, Father, for your goodness to us. Wow, this is important. This is good. This is wonderful. This is so like you uh, because you are love. This is so like the Savior because he is the real life, real world demonstration of your love for mankind, particularly the elect. We're so thankful for the Savior and pray that you might work in our lives, that we might be those who demonstrate your love and the love of Christ through us to others as a way of preparing for persecution, but also just because it's important and it's something that is so crucial to, to Christians being Christians. Bless now, we pray in Jesus' name, the study of your word, that it might be memorable, that it might have an impact on us, that we might incorporate it into our daily lives, because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm wondering if you have a question related to the...